everybody. How are you doing today? Spring has come with so many uh, flower blossoms. So I'm so happy. But we have to pray for the people of Ukraine. Uh, we hope that the uh, war ends soon. And I hope that Putin change, changes his mind for uh, finishing the war as soon as possible. So today I am going to present you about the contamination by the weapons. And it is what is happening now in Ukraine, in Syria, Afghanistan, Myanmar, and in China, many parts of the world. So uh, this is not a past problem. It is ongoing problem. So this tema for today is a very tough one, but let's have patience for better understand, understanding of the human behavior and how to uh, mitigate it. So let's have, let's get started. These are the keywords, nuclear weapon, depleted uranium bomb, contamination by the nuclear weapon, cluster bomb and mines, and war in Ukraine that began on 24th February, 2020. Last week, and just it is continuing. So let's first, first see about the, this uh, present problem. Why has Russia invaded Ukraine? This is uh, the article of the the independent of the United Kingdom. Going back eight years gives the current crisis more context. Russia annexed Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula in 2014 after the country's Moscow friendly president, Viktor Yanukovych, was driven from power by mass protests. Weeks later, Russia threw its weight behind a separatist insurgency that broke out in Ukraine's east, which eventually saw the pro-Russian rebels declare the DPR and LPR independent states. Although they previously went entirely unacknowledged by the international community. More than 14,000 people have died in the fighting that has been ongoing throughout the intervening years and which has devastated Ukraine's Eastern industrial heartland. So uh, it seems that it began last week, but it continues from 2014. That's the reason why it is a very big war now. This is the breakaway regions and major cities in Ukraine. Here is Kyiv, the capital of uh, this country, Ukraine. And this is the Crimean Peninsula. And this is the Donetsk and Luhansk. And Russia annexed Crimea in 2014. And Moscow-backed groups later declared People's Rep Republics in Donetsk and Luhansk here, which are not internationally recognized. As of early this week, rebels held only parts of the two eastern regions highlighted. Only this. And Russia has finally launched its long feared full scale invasion of Ukraine after Putin announced a special military operation in a televised address to his citizens in the early hours of Thursday morning. So we know about that. We knew uh, since the um, 
Olympic in Peking. Explosions were reported soon afterwards on the outskirts of the city of Kharkiv here, Kramatorsk, Mariupol, as well as the capital, Kiev, prompting many Ukrainians to form queues at supermarkets, ATMs, and petrol stations in preparation for weathering the siege or attempting to flee. This is a uh, Russia-Ukraine war. People walk past a queue of cars heading to the Poland border near Shehini, Western Ukraine. This is on March 1st, 2022, two days ago. So this queue of cars doesn't run. It is so congestioned. And Russia's invasion of Ukraine entered its sixth day on Tuesday, March 1st, with a huge convoy of Russian tanks and armored vehicles on the road to the capital, Kyiv, and fighting intensifying there and in the other big cities. This is from the AP News. Russia shelled several key sites in Kyiv and in the country's second largest city, Kharkiv, killing at least 11 people and wounding dozens of others, Ukrainian officials said. Among the sites hit were Kyiv's main TV tower and the Holocaust Memorial. Although Ukrainian forces have slowed Russia's advance and still control Kharkiv and the coastal cities of Kherson and Mariupol, all three are encircled, according to the United Kingdom Ministry of Defense. Among the weapons which have been seen moving towards the capital are TPS-1, thermobaric launchers, very dangerous, this, BM-21, 122-millimeter grad, BM-21 with 2020-millimeter radar. This is another destruction death in Ukraine under bombardment. This is the picture of March 1st, but today is March 3rd, but now uh, we have thousands of people killed. And we have to pay attention to the Russian cluster bombs because uh, cluster bombs is internationally banned. So it is a kind of crime using this kind of cluster bombs nowadays. And the Russian military has also been accused of using cluster bombs in attack that killed a child and two adults hiding in a preschool in northeastern Ukraine. So it is a war against the civilians, not only military uh, reason. The, and the cluster bombs or cluster munitions release hundreds of smaller munitions or bomblets over a wide area wreaking catastrophic damage and casualties. Human Rights Watch said it has also identified examples of cluster munition use. On Friday, it said a cluster bomb had been used the day before by the Russian military in the town of Vuleda. Four civilians were killed in the attack, the organization said. Human Rights Watch describes the weapon as posing an immediate threat to civilians during conflict by randomly scattering submunitions or bomblets over a wide area. Billingcat, a website specializing in investigations and verification, said on Sunday that it had located multiple sites in Ukraine where cluster munitions had been used. It outlined two at the preschool in the city of Okitirka and in Kharkiv, 
where it had verified social media reports of cluster munition attacks. More than 100 countries have committed never to use the weapons under the Convention on Cluster Munitions. We have this Convention on Cluster Munitions, including the United Kingdom, but neither Russia or nor Ukraine have signed the agreement. They are out of this convention. And Putin is putting Russia's nuclear forces on high alert. For two decades, Putin has struck rivals as reckless impulsive. His behavior in ordering an invasion of Ukraine has some in the West questioning whether the Russian president has become dangerously unstable psychologically. And about the thermobaric weapons used by the uh, Russians. CNN reported that the Russian TOS-1 rocket launchers able to launch up to 30 rockets armed with thermobaric warheads had mobilized in Eastern Ukraine, March 1st, 2022. The weapons come in various sizes, from rocket propelled grenades designed for close combat to large versions that can be deployed from planes. Concerns are mounting that Russia is preparing to use thermobaric weapons as part of its invasion of Ukraine. The weapons which effectively create a massive shock wave, which sucks the air out of the lungs of its victims, have reportedly been seen near the city of Kharkiv in Ukraine's east. The use would mark an escalation in the assault by Rus Russian forces, which are targeting cities across the country, including the capital Kiev. That's why uh, killing ki killed persons are increasing in thousands in the last day. These thermobaric weapons ignite the surrounding air, producing a little shock wave and sucking the air from the lungs of anyone in the vicinity. So dangerous. They are far more powerful than conventional explosives. The thermobaric weapons, also known as fuel air bombs and vacuum bombs, also have a longer burn time, burn time, which increases their destructive capacity. It is not a modern weapon, but it is very powerful. A typical fuel air bomb consists of a container of fuel and two separate explosive charges. The first charge bursts open the container to disperse the fuel in a cloud that mixes with oxygen in the air. The cloud of fuel then flows around objects and into structures. The second charge then detonates the cloud, creating a massive blast wave. This is a picture of a military airplane attacked in Kiev, EPA. Russian military have been using an array of aircraft in its attack on Ukraine. Their planes are capable of firing guided air to ground missiles or dropping cluster or fragmentation bombs. A United States defense official has said that early intelligence suggested that the Russian military had been using 75 fixed wing bomber planes to focus on striking the Ukrainian air defenses and ammunition stores. The Amnesty International has condemned Russia's reported use of cluster munitions in Ukraine, saying an attack on a preschool may constitute a war crime. Although Putin put Russia's strategic nuclear deterrent forces on high alert, such extreme measures have not been used so far. Instead, 
Russia has deployed some dual capable vehicles that could theoretically launch nuclear weapons near Ukraine. But there are no signs on the ground the country has actually deployed nuclear weapons or nuclear custodial units, according to the group. And Russia itself has not announced any plans to use nuclear weapons. Although reports on the number of nuclear weapons in Russia's arsenal vary, it is believed that they have around 6,200 warheads. Of those, some 1,588 of which are deployed on ballistic missiles and heavy bomber bases with another roughly 977 strategic warheads and 1,912 non-strategic warheads in reserve, according to the bulletin of the atomic scientists. Now, let's see now about the uh, hydrogen bomb and atomic bomb uh, already used in Japan at the end of the big uh, world war. The first test of a thermonuclear weapon or hydrogen bomb in the United States in November 1952 yielded an explosion on the order of 10,000 kilotons of TNT. Thermonuclear bombs start with the same fission reaction that powers atomic bombs. But the majority of the uranium or plutonium in atomic bombs actually goes unused. In a thermonuclear bomb, an additional step means that more of the bomb's explosive power becomes available. First, an igniting explosion compresses a sphere of plutonium-239. The material that will then undergo fission. Inside this pit of plutonium-239 is a chamber of hydrogen gas. The high temperatures and pressures created by the plutonium-239 fission cause the hydrogen atoms to fuse. This fusion process releases neutrons, which feed back into the plutonium-239, splitting more atoms and boosting the fission chain reaction. We learned in the previous lecture about the plutonium-239 uh, that is uh, produced, formed in the reactor of the uh, nuclear power plant. So many countries with the nuclear power plant have the accumulation of plutonium-239 for thousands of tons. So it is very dangerous. And Six tons of plutonium-239 is enough to produce a um, hydrogen bomb and atomic bomb. So, so many countries now has the nuclear power plant and many, many countries uh, is not in the uh, under the convention of non-proliferating uh, atomic uh, weapons. So it is very important, these global monitoring systems to detect tests of nuclear weapons, where it was uh, detected, it is very important. So governments around the world use global monitoring systems to detect nuclear tests as part of the effort to enforce the 1996 Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, CTBT. There are 183 signatories to this treaty, but it is not in force because key nations, including the United States, didn't ratify it. Since 1996, Pakistan, India, and North Korea have carried out nuclear tests. Nevertheless, the treaty put in place system of seismic monitoring that can differentiate a nuclear explosion from an earthquake. 
The CTBT International Monitoring System also includes stations that detect the infrasound. Uh, infrasound means sound whose frequency is too low for human ears to detect. So, uh, to detect that infrasound from explosions, uh, this is a very important uh, station for the monitoring system. 80 radionuclide monitoring stations around the globe major atmospheric fallout, which can prove that an explosion detected by other monitoring system was in fact nuclear. So now let's see about the Russian uh, new nuclear weapon. Russia has for months been testing a giant nuclear weapons delivery system that can carry 10 heavyweight warheads, enough power to wipe out Texas or France. So they can also uh, wipe out Ukraine if it is used. So that's why Putin, uh, Putin now is willing to test this uh, weapon that he, that the Russians develop, is developing. But the RS-28 Sarmat intercontinental ballistic missile, known in Russia as Saturn II, has been de delayed yet again, suggesting Moscow is having a harder time than expected updating its nuclear arsenal. Russia began testing the Sarmat in 2017 and had been expected to enter it into service in 2018. It was slated to be Russia's first new intercontinental ballistic missile in decades and much bigger than its US counterpart, the Minuteman III, which carries three warheads. The Russian weapon was designed to push through US missile defenses. It is expected to replace the RS-36M, which was known as Saturn by NATO in the 1970s. This is the report of NBC News. This is the Samat RS-28 Intercontinental Ballistic Missile for Newsweek so big compared to the, this person, this photographer. So Russia has the world's most nuclear weapons with 7,300. This is, uh, the date is in 2017. It's unclear now when the intercontinental nuclear missile will join Russia's fleet. New testing might not happen until later this year, this year, the Moscow Times reported Thursday. The cause of the setback has not been reported. Russia's Mekiev Rocket Design Bureau declass declassified in October the first image of the SMART and it was accompanied by a short test. In accordance with the decree of the Russian government on the state defense order for 2010 and the planning period 2012 to 2013, the Makiev Rocket Design Bureau was instructed to start design and development work on the summit. And in June 2011, the Russian Ministry of Defense signed a state contract for the summit's development. The prospective strategic missile system is being developed in order to create a natured and effective nuclear deterrent for Russia's strategic forces. The US is in second place with 6,970 nuclear weapons. Only seven other nations in the world have nuclear weapons and combined they have fewer weapons than either the US or Russia. They are France, China, United Kingdom, 
Pakistan, India, Israel, and North Korea, according to the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. This is the American nuclear bomb, B-6112. Uh, standing next to a 12-foot nuclear bomb that looks more like a trim missile than a weapon of mass destruction, engineer Phil Hoover exudes pride. I feel a real sense of accomplishment, he said. Phil Hoover, he, is an engineer at Sandia National Laboratories, shows off a flight test body for B-61-12 nuclear weapon. He and fellow engineers at Sandia National Laboratories have spent the past few years designing, building, and testing the top secret electronic and mechanical innards of the sophisticated B-61-12. And this B-61-12 is more than three times more powerful than the US atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, Japan, 77 years ago, that killed more than 130,000 people at once. Later, when nuclear explosives are added at the Federal Pantex plant near Amarillo, Texas, the bomb will have a maximum explosive force equivalent to 50,000 tons of TNT. The US government doesn't consider the B-6112 to be new, simply an upward upgrade of an existing weapon. But some contend that it is far more than that. This is the place where it is developed. So now let's think about the prevention of the nuclear war. If they are uh, improving each year the power of the nuclear weapon, it means that they would like to use it one day, but we have to ban it. We do not have a nuclear guided bomb in our arsenal today, Christensen said. It is a new weapon. Christensen's organization was formed in 1945 by nuclear scientists who wanted to prevent a nuclear war. And it's not the maximum force of the B-6112 that worries him the most on that front. 1945 is the year that the big world war ended. So he says he fears that the bomb's greater accuracy coupled with the way its explosive force can be reduced electronically through a dial a yield system accessed by a hatch on the bomb's body increases the risk that the president might consider it tame enough for a future conflict. And the Pete Dominici National Security Innovation Center at Sandia National Laboratories is named for the longtime New Mexico Senator renowned as a champion of nuclear weapons for more than three decades. And Congress shared similar concerns in rejecting other so-called low intensity nuclear weapons in the past. But, must, but most of the national criticism of this bomb has focused on its price tag. After it goes into full production in 2020, Taxpayers will have spent about $11 billion to build 400 B-6112 bombs. That sum is more than double the original estimate. And even at that is a fraction of costs associated with modernizing the US nuclear arsenal. To Christensen and others, if President Barack Obama pledge at that time, was serious, the bomb shouldn't exist at any price. Because Barack Obama get the Nobel Prize of peace because he said that he would abolish the nuclear weapon. 
how the B-61-12 entered the U.S. arsenal of weapons is a tale of the extraordinary influence of the nuclear enterprise. As the nuclear weapons complex has rebranded itself in recent years. So, nuclear weapons is uh, linked with this US congressional campaigns. Its story lies at the heart of the national debate over the ongoing modernization of America's nuclear weapons, a program projected to cost $348 billion over the next decade. This enterprise encompasses defense contractors, including the subsidiary of Lockheed Martin Corporation that runs the Sandia Labs here for the government, as well as the US Department of Energy and the nuclear weapons oriented wings of the US military, particularly the Air Force and Navy. With abundant jobs and dollars at stake, the nuclear enterprise is backed by politicians of, a stripe, of all stripes. A review of several thousands of pages of congressional testimony, federal budgets and audit reports, plus an analysis of lobbying and campaign contribution data shows that the four defense on contractors running the two New Mexico nuclear weapons labs, Sandia, and Los Alamos National Laboratory enjoy a particularly symbiotic relationship with Congress. That relationship begins with money. Since 1998, these four contractors have contributed more than $20 million to congressional campaigns around the nation. Last year alone, they spent almost $18 million lobbying Washington. Those numbers alone indicate that the nuclear weapons enterprise has had plenty at stake in recent years. Well, let's see now about the new strategic arms reduction treat in Prague in 20, 2009. Obama called for the elimination of nuclear weapons, as you know. A year later, he and Russian leader Dmitry Med Medvedev at that time signed the new strategic arms reduction treaty calling for each country to reduce its deployed strategic warheads to 1,550 by 2018 down from estimates of more than 1,900 for the United States and more than 2,400 for Russia. Hence, Chris Stenson, a nuclear weapons expert at the Nonpartisan Federation of American Scientists in Washington, is resolute that the bomb violates a 2010 Obama administration pledge not to produce nuclear weapons with new military capabilities. This is the movement for the ban to the nuclear weapons. Sign the nuclear weapons ban treaty. This is in Japan. The treaty on the prohibition on nuclear weapons is set to enter into force on January 22, after Honduras on Saturday became the fifth country to ratify it. No nuclear powers have endorsed the pact. As the only country to have suffered a nuclear attack, Japan has sought to present itself as a leader in international efforts for nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. But Japan also depends on the US nuclear umbrella to protect it from threats including North Korean missiles preventing it from endorsing a no out ban on production, use and stockpiling of nuclear weapons. 
but Japan will not join UN, UN United Nations Nuclear Ban Treaty, says government spokesman. This is uh, from the Japan Times, October 2021, last year. Survivals of the 1945 United States atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and other anti-nuclear activists have urged the administration of Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga at that time to sign onto the historic but largely symbolic treaty. So, biological weapons was burned, were burned in 1972. Chemical weapons banned 1993. Landmines banned 1997. Cluster bombs that was used, that were used now by the Russians in Ukraine. It was banned in 2008. Nuclear weapons, when it will be burned? It has to be banned as soon as possible. This is a um, very famous video of Hiroshima Nagasaki, August 1945, by Bano Eric, 1908 to 2001. And it is free download, barrel, borrow, and stream. It is in the Internet Archive. And if you click in here, you can uh, watch this video. This publication was uh, dated in 1969. Topics of Hiroshima Nagasaki, August 1945. I recommend that you watch this video. How dangerous and how stupid is this nuclear weapon? Killing so many people at once and de destructing one city, whole city in seconds. This is the Hiroshima, uh, bomb used for uh, destroying Hiroshima. And this is the little boy. Very little bomb. The nuclear weapons are being tested as powerful as the 12 minute reel below was produced by the US War Department in 1946. Tale of two cities make selective use of film that was confiscated from a Japanese filmmaker, Akira Iwasaki. Though you wouldn't know that from the narration, which posts that army cameramen have found and film pictorial evidence that tells interested steel and stone the effect of death dealing atomic power. This is the little boy, an American uranium bomb thrown on Hiroshima. And some 20 years later, historian Eric Barno obtained more of Iwasaki's footage and produced it, a remarkably different narrative that documented the horrible physical impact of the attacks on Hiroshima citizens. These are the American bombs used for destructing Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Hiroshima, this one, and Nagasaki, this one. This was thrown in August 6th, and this was thrown in August 9th, 30 days after Hiroshima. This is the uh, uranium-235 here, and the Nagasaki used the mechanism of plutonium-239, uranium-238 uh, absorbing the neutron, it changed to plutonium-239. This is the polonium beryllium initiator for uh, changing the uranium-238 to plutonium-239.
This is Hiroshima, August 6, 1945. This is a picture uh, taken on uh, soon after this destruction. This, this was the Catholic Church. This is a horse killed at once. And 76, now is 78 years past since atomic bombing. And the atomic bomb was thrown in Hiroshima here and Nagasaki here. The map is not so clear, but Hiroshima is here. Here is Nagasaki. Children suffering from the atomic bomb soon after the explosion. So uh, the hospitals were destroyed and doctors had no medicine, medication. So they have to die. The baby is crying. The, uh, maybe he lost her mother or father at once. So many children left alone. So what is the difference between the hydrogen bomb and the atomic bomb? Atomic bomb is the initiator for the hydrogen bomb. So hydrogen bombs or thermonuclear bombs are more powerful than atomic or fission bombs. The difference between thermonuclear bombs and fission bombs begins at the atomic level. The hydrogen bomb is the fusion and uh, atomic bomb is the fission. And the fission bombs, of, uh, they were the bombs used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Fission bombs, like those used to devastate the Japanese cities of Nagasaki and Hiroshima during World War II, work by splitting the nucleus of an atom. When the neutrons or neutral particles of the atom's nucleus split, some hit the nuclei of nearby atoms, splitting them too. The result is a very explosive chain reaction. In the nuclear power plant, this rain chain reaction is stopped using the light water. But in the bombs, it is not necessary. What they need is the chain reaction. And so nobody will stop it. The bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki exploded with the yield of 15 kilotons and 20 kilotons of TNT, respectively, according to the Union of Concerned Scientists. And so many people are uh, remember only on the Nagasaki and Hiroshima's uh, nuclear bomb. But before the nuclear bomb was used, uh, main, main city of Japan was attacked by the B-60, B-29 uh, bombs of the airplane from the aircraft. And this is after the uh, explosion of Tokyo, uh, remaining bombs were used for attacking Nagoya. This is a Nagoya castle in fire. After attack of US B-29 air raid, from five directions with 250 airplanes at early morning on May 14, 1945. I think that in, in the attack of Tokyo, it was used to 90 airplanes. So in Nagoya, they used 250 airplanes. Nagoya is in Aichi Prefecture. And Aichi Prefecture uh, have a lot of uh, 
industries of aircraft and armaments and stores. That's why uh, they used the remaining, the rest of the bombs to attack. The castle uh, burned out and the castle that is now, we can see now today uh, was reconstructed. So this is a very sad imagery of the attack of B-29. Not only Nagoya, also big cities, uh, Osaka and Kobe, Tokyo, Yokohama, and many other big cities and smaller cities with factories, industries uh, were attacked. So all over Japan, it was just like Iraq and Afghanistan. So it was a very uh, sad scene all over Japan. So after the big uh, war, war, World War II, uh, Japan was uh, commanded by the United States. And after the Constitution of Japan Article 9 was uh, written, and it, it says, aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and other, uh, the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as means of settling international disputes. In order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. So that's why after the war for 77 years, uh, Japan kept peaceful uh, never attacking other countries. So now the Congress is uh, thinking about change, changing this constitution because we have so many threats from North Korea, uh, China, Russia, and they would, they are uh, threatening Japan for taking the territories, Japanese territories, uh, to assimilate to their countries. Now let's see about the mines. So many mines were used during the war. And after war, we had many conflicts in Cambodia, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, Myanmar, many, many countries. And even after the war, the mine, the mines continue underground. So there are countries with this kind of signs in the roads or in the pathways to, to schools, danger, mines. So United Nations uh, say, say that 10 years ago, a convention to ban anti-personal mines came into force. Despite progress, Millions of people globally are still affected by landmines and unexploded ordnance. United Nations mine action teams task, tasked with clearing the explosive leftovers of war are trained annually to face the realities of post-conflict areas. So you should take a look at this mine action exercise of the United Nations. 
clicking. How is the mind like? This is the uh, Russian uh, mind, PMN2, uh, most uh, used in Cambodia. It is uh, made of plastic. This is another Russian PMN. It is made of wood. It is said also a uh, black widow, widower. This is of the East Germany PPM, East German PPM. Now, uh, doesn't exist the East German, Germany, but at that time it was East Germany. This is also antipersonal blast mine. This is Chinese one, type 72B plastic. This is the most dangerous mine in Cambodia. And uh, in Japan, there are some com companies that uh, has that have the project for removing mines. And Komatsu is one of that those country those companies. Komatsu is a Japanese heavy machinery company, and there are more than one. Me, uh, 100 million mines underground in the world as a consequence of the World War, Cold War, and Civil War. This company not only has been removing the mines in Cambodia, but also building nine schools to the community of 2,000 people, 2,300 hectares of cropland, paving 75 kilometers of road to the residents after removing mines. Because this company uh, makes the uh, paving machine or uh, bulldozers, bulldozers, power shovels. And so they can use this machinery for uh, helping people. So since 2016, Komatsu is also removing 8,000 cluster mines. Cluster mines is also a very dangerous mine. So this is a, a very important project. This is another uh, video that you can take a look at. This is in Afghanistan, a 15 year old boy uh, stepped on the mine uh, underground. And this is the injury that he suffered. This is another boy of Af Afghanistan, uh, missing two legs. And he is using this plate to uh, walk around. This is the picture of cluster, back, cluster uh, mines. This is in, in a bomb. Uh, there are so many mines, and once it uh, scatters uh, in the air, it will be scattered for a very big area. This is a failed bomb, so there are many, many uh, mines that uh, still is not uh, exploded, but it is very dangerous. So we have another one, Kiyoshi Amemiya. It is another uh, president of a construction machinery company that helps uh, to eliminate, remove the mines. He has been removing mine all over the world for 10 years. Once he visited Cambodia and was shocked seeing so many people without legs or arms because of the mines. People were scared with the mines and he began working for that, for helping them. After three years of project failure, he felt shattered, but many people of Hitachi and Cambodia supported him. 
to go on with his project. In 1999, he could accomplish the same. Nowadays, that machine is being used not only in Cambodia, but also in Afghanistan and Vietnam. There are more than 100 million mines in the world and 70 people are dying blown up, stepping on the mine every day. And we need still 1,000 years to remove all the mines of the world. So this man, Kiyoshi Amemiya of, uh, of this company, Toshiba, Hitachi, Hitachi, he uh, made, he uh, developed, invented a machine for removing, not one by one, but at once in a small area. You can see it in this uh, video. Now, another problem of the weapons is a nuclear weapon also. This is a depleted uranium-120 milliliter bomb used by the United States at the Gulf War in 1991. This is the cross section of this bomb. Uh, here, it is used the uh, depleted uranium. Depleted uranium is the uranium-238. That is not uh, used as a fuel, and so uh, in every countries that have the nuclear power plant have this uh, nuclear garbage. So uh, it is day a day accumulating. So the Americans uh, made use of these. Uh, depleted uranium for uh, usage for the uh, weapons as a raw material for the uh, nuclear weapon. So it was used in a uh, Gulf War and at that time, Saddam Hussein was still claiming victory, but he was killed uh, some years later. But the war's legacy for his country has been international isolation, sanctions, and economic collapse. Uh, the Gulf War began because Saddam Hussein of Iraq, he uh, invade, invaded Kuwait. So, why he invaded Kuwait? Because he wanted the refinery of Kuwait, the petroleum. So uh, United States uh, went behind them. Uh, so they sent a lot of uh, soldiers to Kuwait. And the war was held in Iraq. So in Iraq's war, a depleted uranium was used as a weapon. Iraqis themselves say the conflict has taken a great toll on the country's health due to NATO's use of depleted uranium in its weapons during the war. So American uh, army uh, brought to NATO this uh, depleted uranium weapon. There are war memorials. There are war memorials in the city of Basra, signifying glory in the mother of all battles. But the conflict led to Iraq beating a retreat from neighboring Kuwait. It was followed by sanctions and economic ruin. Another legacy of the war, according to Iraq is widespread environmental contamination by the depleted uranium. So this economic sanction uh, that is uh, now in the Ukraine's 
it will result in a catastrophic uh, economic war also at the same time. So let's see about the weapon used in the Gulf War. About 300 tons of bombs with depleted uranium were dropped on Iraq. The people say the metal is poisoning their livestock. And a farmer of that area is convinced, convinced his sheep grazing land was contaminated, saying when the animals eat the grass, they die. He's lost 18 sheep so far at that time. A tomato field also was affected. For years, Iraq has insisted there's a link between depleted uranium and human health. Kadam Ali agrees that the whole area is covered with uranium, and his son Yusef had been sick for about three years after war. Iraq says there's been a sharp increase in cancer cases and cancer death since the end of the war. Child mortality has increased. While the bombing campaign ended almost a decade ago, the citizens believe they and their children continue to pay the price. So many leukemia cases after the Gulf War because of the uh, depleted uranium weapon. Al Jazeera reporter Da Jamali discussed how the United States invasion of Iraq has left behind a legacy of cancer and birth defects suspected of being caused by the depleted uranium. Noting the birth defects in the Iraqi city of Fallujah, Jamel says, they are extremely hard to bear witness to, but it's something that we all need to pay attention to. What this has generated is from 2004 up to this day, we are seeing a rate of congenital malformations in the city of Fallujah that has surpassed even that in the wake of the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that nuclear bombs were dropped on at the end of World War II. Jamal has also reported on the refugee crisis of more than 1 million displaced Iraqis still inside the country who are struggling to survive without government aid, a majority of them living in Baghdad. Now let's see about another problem, only problems of North Korea. This is the North Korea provocation in January and February, 2022. North Korea, fired seven mi missiles in January and one missile in February towards Japan EEZ in 2022. It is one of the few savage countries of the world which doesn't respect the EEZ of neighbor nation. The latest launch was done on 31st being of the same type as fired in September 2021, provoking Japan. Japan has an Article 9 as we saw in the slide before the, of the constitution, which declares peaceful behavior and no attack to the other countries. And the neighbor countries know about that constitution and are provoking Japan. They know that Japan will not attack them ever. Uh, North Korea launched two ballistic missiles, believe it to be the medium range Nodong Wednesday morning with one landing in waters within Japan's exclusive economic zone, EEZ, after flying some 1000 kilometers, according to the Joint Chiefs of Staffs. This is the approximate path of North Korean missile. We never know when they uh, begin, begin uh, launching, for firing. Af only after 
it drops, the missile drops uh, Japanese defense, uh, makes the calculation. It's always all after launching. The other missile is believed to have exploded immediately after launch, the JCS said. Japanese Defense Minister Gen Nakatani told reporters that one missile appeared to have landed in Japan's EEZ 250 kilometers west of the Oga Peninsula in Akita Prefecture here. It was the first time for any North Korean missiles to have landed in Japan's EEZ waters. This is the Japan's uh, territory. Military officials and the experts here believe that the NAS latest launch was apparently to show off its ability to strike targets in Japan, including bases of the United States forces Japan. Citing the repressive state's recent provocations to protest the planned deployment of a U.S. terminal high altitude air defense, THAAD battery in South Korea. South Korea is here. So let's see about the Nodon type missile of North Korea. The missiles believed to be the Nodon type were fired from near Eunyu in South Hwangae province, province at 7.50 a.m., said the JCS. One missile flew some 1,000 kilometers while the other one exploded right after launch. The Nodon has a maximum range of 1,300 1, kilometers and can hit car targets on the Japanese mainland and Okinawa. The JCS also noted, by firing ballistic missiles that potentially can be mounted with nuclear warheads, the North openly showed its ambition and willingness to st strike South Korea's ports and air bases as well as surrounding nations. North Korea provoking Japan firing missiles on 29 August 2017. This is in 2017. No effort was made by Japan to shoot down the missile, but it issued a safety warning telling citizens in Hokkaido to take shelter in a sturdy building or basement. US and Japanese forces have just finished a joint drill in Hokkaido while another annual exercise involving tens of thousands of South Korean and US military personnel is still underway in South Korea. The NAS sees these regular military drills involving the US as highly provocative, perceiving them as a rehearsal for an invasion. Four missiles were launched into this area with three landing in Japan's EEZ. This is the Oga Peninsula, North Korea, Pyongyang. This is the Donchanri, about 1,000 kilometers. This is outside EEZ of Japan. This is South Korea, Japan, Tokyo here. This is Sea of Japan. And this point is 300 to 350 kilometers of Oga Peninsula, Japan. And now let's see about the Okinawa and the two Japans. Japan is this, Okinawa is here. This is the epicenter of massive earthquake of Fukushima Daiichi hit in 2011, uh, March 11th. This is the Fukushima nuclear facility. And we, uh, I'd like to show you where is the US bases in Japan? There are so many. In the mainland, 
we have Yokota Air Base, Yokosuka no Naval Base, and here is Naval Air Facility Atsugi, and this is Camp Zama. Camp Zama. So many. So maybe North Korea is uh, willing to attack them, his bases near Tokyo. And we also have in Yamaguchi, Marine Air Station Iwakuni, here, very near the Korean Peninsula. And we also have Sasebo Naval Base here in Kyushu. And in Okinawa, uh, is the site of more than 75% 70 of US bases. So US bases are concentrated in Okinawa. And if you'd like to know more about that, uh, please take a look at this uh, video. One of the tragic legacies of World War II and the early Cold War was the creation of divided countries, notably Korea, Vietnam, Germany, and China. In a perverse way, the San Francisco system made Japan another divided country by detaching Okinawa Prefecture, the southern part of the Ryukyu Island chain here, from the rest of the nation and turning it into a US military bastion. So for many, many years, until 1972, Okinawa was almost American uh, country, uh, only American base. Even with prefecture of Okinawa, uh, the mayor uh, hasn't uh, power for uh, govern governing Okinawa. It was governed by the U US. The San Francisco settlement formalized this policy by excluding Okinawa from the general peace terms. The prefecture remained under US administration with only residual sovereignty vested in Japan. This is Okinawa. And you can see here so many, many, many American bases, only American bases, American bases. During the Korean War, B-29 super fortress bombers that attacked Japan in 1945, 19, uh, in the last years of the war. Uh, the B-29 that bombarded Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, and other big factories, industrial factories. The same B-29 which only a few years earlier had firebombed the cities of Japan, flew missions to Korea from Okinawa's Kadena Air Force Base. The Korean War was soon after the end of the big World War II. Between 1965 and 1972, Okinawa was a key staging area for the devastating US air war against North Vietnam, as well as the secret bombing attacks on Cambodia and Laos during the Cold War. Although administration of Okinawa was restored to Japan in 1972, after 27 years of direct US control, this didn't diminish the prefecture's role as the centerpiece of America's forward military posture in Asia. So about the two Japans, the ongoing impact of this two Japans policy operates at many levels. Most obvious is a degradation inevitable in any such gargantuan military based milieu, including GI crimes, noise pollution, and environmental destruction. So many GI crimes uh, raping the young girls of Okinawa, and they couldn't say nothing, uh, anything, because it was United States. And the sentence was not uh, never 
set by the Japanese tribunal because uh, it was governed by the United States. So many girls sacrificed by the GIs, the soldiers, American soldiers. And less visible is the institutionalized practice of non-transparency, duplicity, and hypocrisy by both the United States and Japanese governments as seen in revelations of secret activities and agreements involving storage on Okinawa soil of both nuclear weapons and chemical weapons such as Agent Orange. This is the dioxin, very uh, dangerous uh, chemical that it was used in Vietnam, creating so many, many uh, suffering for people and still now. And most pernicious of all perhaps is a shameful spectacle of a government that has consigned a specific portion of its land to extensive military use by a foreign power and simultaneously treated its populace there as second class citizens. So still now, there is a discrimination between the main island people and Okinawan people. And in Japan, uh, because of the influence of the World War II, we have unresolved territorial issues. One in Dokudo, Takishima Island, the South Korean people are saying that this island is theirs. And here is the Senkaku Island. And the Chinese people are likely to take this island. And the Russian people, the Russian government, this is the island that were four islands that were Japanese. But after the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing, Russia um, quickly took these islands. So five territorial disputes that plague relation in the Asia Pacific region today trace back to issues of sovereignty left unresolved in the San Francisco Peace Treaty. Nor was this ambiguity a matter of simple inadvertence or oversight. On the contrary, much of it was deliberately introduced in the final drafts of the people of the peace treaty by the United States in conformity with Washington's overall strategy of thwarting communist influence in Asia. And let's see about the territorial disputes for the energy resources in the Japan Sea. Why they are uh, like, likely to take these islands? Unsurprisingly, these disputes mostly involve countries that didn't participate in the separate peace. Notably, the Soviet Union, now Russia, South Korea, and China. Three of the disputes involve Japan directly. All of them have become highly contentious issues in the decades following the San Francisco conference. National pride and strategic concerns naturally underlie these conflicting ter territorial claims. But in several cases, their intensification in recent years also reflects the discovery of maritime resources, such as undersea oil and natural gas deposits, including the uh, rare earth and rare metals. And let's see about the territorial dispute with Russia that involves what Japan calls the Northern Territories and Russia, the Southern Kuril Islands, focusing on four islands or island clusters, North of Hokkaido, Northern Island of Japan. The issue hinges in considerable part of whether 
these islands are properly regarded as part of the Kuro chain or of Hokkaido. And it is complicated by the Soviet Union's abrupt transformation from ally to enemy in American eyes during the course of 1945 to 1947. At the secret big three Yalta conference in February, 1945, the United States and Britain agreed that the Kuro Islands would be handed over to the Soviet Union following Japan's defeat. This was one of the inducements the Anglo powers used to persuade the, United, uh, the Union, so Soviet Union to enter the war against Japan. And when the war ended, Soviet forces took over the Kuros, including the now disputed islands. The United States reversed its position as the Cold War took hold on hold. And by the time of the San Francisco Conference, essentially viewed the contested islands as Japanese territory under Soviet military occupation. Although the 1951 peace treaty stated that Japan renounced all right title and claim to the Kuro Islands, it neither assigned the Kuros to the Soviet Union, nor mentioned the names of the disputed islands. So it's so complicated nowadays in Japan, this uh, problem of territory. To finalize, I'd like to show you the latest modern weapons. This is a French uh, robot uh, aircraft. There are so many modern uh, aircrafts, uh, weapon aircrafts. So uh, they, these kind of aircrafts are remote controlled, no person on it. So the references are this. So uh, I'd like that you uh, take a look at this. And thank you very much for the patience for watching this uh, lecture. And I hope you add something new in your uh, knowledge. Okay, thank you very much and see you on my next lecture. Bye for now. Uh, stay safe and stay, stay healthy. Bye for now.